Welcome everybody to our first lecture on ancient Greece. I'm pretty excited to be talking about the Greeks, one of my favorite civilizations out there. So what I want you to do is in this first section we're going to be talking about the Greek Dark Ages and the Greek Dark Ages roughly last from 1100 maybe 1150 BC to about 800 BC. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to focus on the following aspects in particular. I'd like you to describe the economic system of Dark Age Greece. How did this, meaning the economic system, impact the social structure? What was the connection between the two? How was the political structure set up? Did it have anything to do with the economic or social structure? Okay, so let's jump in. Well, first of all, let's talk about where we are. We've already talked about this area over here. This is Mesopotamia. And we've talked about this area over here, Egypt. We've even talked about this area over here. This is Asia Minor. And so the area we're going to be focusing on is just a little to the west of Asia Minor. And this, of course, is Greece. One of the most important things that we can understand about Greece is its geography. And this is similar to many other countries and many other regions we've looked at. Geography is destiny to some degree. So one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that Greece is really mountainous. Hopefully this topographical map here demonstrates this. There are just tons of mountains in Greece. And in between these mountains, there's little flat plains that people can grow food in. And so what this means is that, and there's not a, a large river that uh, goes through it. There are little rivers, but nothing quite like the Tigris or the Euphrates. And so what this means is that Europe, uh, excuse me, Greece is going to be very difficult to unite. Uh, it's going to lend itself to little, small, autonomous communities. These communities, as we're going to see, are going to be very competitive with each other. Uh, war sometimes, and that's going to be the bad side, but their competition is also going to inspire them to try to outdo each other, uh, one of the aspects of ancient Greek society. Okay, well, this soil of Greece also doesn't really lend itself to great agricultural production. Greece has some of the poorest soil in all of Europe, and so the Greeks are always going to to struggle to feed themselves. It's not going to be a rich agricultural area like Egypt, for instance. One of the few things that does grow well in this soil are going to be olives and grapes. And so the products of olives and grapes, namely olive oil and wine, are going to be two of the major exports of ancient Greece and probably modern day Greece too, I would venture to say. And so they're gonna be able to trade these in some cases for food. Should also mention that the sea plays an enormous role in Greek history. In many areas, it's easier to travel by sea to go from one city to another than to go over the rough mountains, at least in pre-modern times. And so the Greeks are going to be more at home in many ways on the sea than they are going to be on land. The sea is going to play an important role in their trade. It's also going to supplement their food source. They're going to be fishermen and the like. And really, anytime we see the Greeks, they are going to be somewhere near the sea, most likely. That's where their settlements are mostly going to be. Well, Greece did produce a Bronze Age civilization, so we're going to go back. We're going back in time somewhat. 
And we're talking about the Mycenaean period, which lasted about 1400 to 1100 BC. This was the first civilization of Greece. And so I'd like you to think about the Bronze Age and some of the aspects of the Bronze Age. We're going to see that the Mycenaean civilization exhibits many of those. All right. And so, as I mentioned, the Mycenaeans lived in Greece, and so they're going to live in isolated settlements themselves. The Mycenaeans, there's never going to be a capital of the Mycenaeans. Some cities will be bigger than the other, and so on and so forth, but it's going to be divided like later Greeks are going to be divided. Now, if you think back to the Bronze Age, you may remember that oftentimes we saw either a temple or a palace-based economy. And to just review what that is, you have a central location, either a temple or a palace. In our case, it's going to be a palace here. And the palace is going to control the countryside. The peasants that live there are going to pay uh, a large amount of their uh, produce as taxes to the uh, palace structure. The palace is also going to support craftsmen and workmen, and it's going to be a highly regulated uh, hierarchical society with the king at the top and his bureaucrats and whatever else in that hierarchy, all the way down to the peasant. Okay. Well, this Mycenaean civilization thrived till about 1100 BC. And then disaster occurred, the Greek Dark Ages. Now, you may also remember this. Remember we talked about the Sea Peoples? The Sea Peoples came off the ocean, uh, mysterious groups of people. Well, Greece was really ground zero for this. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of evidence that the Sea Peoples were of Greek origins themselves. And so whatever the case, it's a little bit of a mystery. Um, Mycenaean civilization got broken up, probably by other Greeks, less civilized Greeks from the north, migrating in to uh, Mycenae. Okay. And we should uh, mention that, as you may remember, this was a time of great violence. And as far as civilization went, it seemed that the people who were closer to the violence suffered more than people who weren't. So Mesopotamia, yeah, it does suck to live there at the time. Egypt does take it on the chin, to be sure. But as you may remember, the Hittites completely destroyed, and the Greeks even worse. This is a, a major calamity for Greece. The population falls. Um, there's uh, the, the palace structure collapses. Society is turned into, cha into chaos. The Greeks even... Uh, forget how to read and write. That's how bad things are. It's a really rough, dark age here. Well, of those people who did invade, roughly they invaded in tribes. And so tribes would have been um, divided into different cohorts of sorts. So there would be an overall tribe and then subgroups in the tribe. And each subgroup would have had its own king. And by king, we shouldn't think of someone like Cyrus the Great, a wonderful, magnificent figure. We should think more like a warlord, more like a gang leader, okay, that might be affiliated with other members of his tribe and maybe some sort of an over king, okay? And so each of these little cohorts, subdivisions of the tribe, whatever you want to call them, would have had a leader, which the Greeks called a king. Along with the king, the king would have attracted to himself elite warrior types. And these folks would have taken the name the Aristoi. That's where we get the word aristocrat from, by the way. And literally what it means is the best one. What made them so good? What made them so good is that they were skilled in arms. Okay? Remember, this is a violent time, and being skilled in arms is what is going to distinguish you from the common people. And the common people of the tribe would have been designated as the demos. It's a Greek word. It's like the people. Okay? And these were non-elite people. Yeah, they, they probably bore some type of arms in these violent times, but they, that wasn't, they weren't elite. 
Okay, that was the king and the Aristoi. Okay, and so this is basically how the tribal structure um, was set up. Now, during the Dark Age, as these tribes settled into Greece, maybe displaced the older people, maybe enslaved them, maybe killed them, whatever the case was, they began to allot land to themselves. Okay, so members of the community who had invaded, members of the tribe, the subgroup of the tribe that invaded, would have been allotted parcels of land. Now, it wasn't exactly fair the way the land would have been divided. The rationale was the king should get the biggest cut of the land. But the elite warriors, who had probably done the majority of the heavy fighting and who were probably tougher than everybody else anyways, got a bigger share. And then the smallest share would have gone to the demos, the average Joe who, you know, bore some arms but didn't do the, the bulk of the fighting. Okay? And so the important point to remember in this, and this is really important, is these are yeoman farmers. What's a yeoman farmer, you may ask? A yeoman farmer is someone who owns their own land. So as unequal as this may sound, it's important to remember that each Greek owned his own plot of land. All right, so in some ways, this is a form of equality. If you go back thinking about the Egyptian peasants who were just completely dominated by the temple or the Mesopotamian peasants who you know lived off temple lands or maybe even earlier Greeks who lived off of the palace economy, right? This isn't the case here. Everybody's get their own little plot of land. Some people more, some people less. And that means they get to keep the economic resources of it. Okay. And so most of these early Greeks were farmers. That was what the typical probably member of the demos did is farmed, making enough to feed their own families. For the wealthy who had more land, they probably engaged partly in herding as well. Herding was a sign of prestige. You get the cow proteins. Um, if you have sheep, the wool that you can get from this, the leather, whatever. It's a sign of prestige. And in this particular economy, gift giving was a way to show off your wealth and status. Okay. And so, um, these uh, powerful men of the time would raise cattle to give off leather goods, maybe uh, offer up sacrifices to the gods. It was a way to show that you were really somebody. Um, another aspect I should mention too is that these early Greeks would have used other people's labor, at least the wealthy would. So maybe some of the previous inhabitants who were captured would have been enslaved, or maybe some poorer Greeks who had fallen on hard times um, would work as uh, laborers on the farms of the wealthy or maybe herding their cattle or something. And so they would do this and it wasn't, it was not where you wanted to be, like not having your own land. So you'd be pretty low, low status. Now, a major way that you could enhance your wealth and your prestige in this society was through brigandage. And that's really a fancy way of saying robbing it. All right. So there was always a need for outside goods, maybe more slaves to work on your land, maybe more cattle. And so what the Aristoi would do, what kings would do, is they would go out and they would raid the villages of people outside your tribe. It was considered bad form to raid a neighboring village of someone who was related to you, but for outside tribes, that was fair game. And what you would try to do is you would try to capture um, slaves for yourself, maybe capture their woman. You might try to rustle up some cattle, take whatever you could, and then get the hell out as soon as possible before other members of the tribe realized what was happening. 
all right and this was considered a prestige activity to do i mean you had to be really tough you had to be fast you had to be strong and so it was a sign of prestige and a good king would provide many opportunities for his aristoi who were who uh were dependent on him to go out and show off their skill and get some more wealth okay violent times to be sure now if we look at the social structure of this society we can see that really at the top in terms of prestige and also in terms of wealth would have been the military elite the king and the aristoi no question right they have the most land they've got the opportunities to rustle up cattle slaves women whatever and they sit at the top below them would have been commoners these are people who would have owned their own land would have been able to take care of themselves not doing great but feeding their families and themselves below them would have been people who were members of the tribe but had fallen on hard times uh, maybe had too many kids and had to send some of them off to work as landless peasants on the estates of the very wealthy finally at the bottom would have been slaves these were people who were not part of the tribe outsiders maybe part of the native inhabitants who had lived there maybe people who had been captured on uh on um cattle raids whatever the case is these were people who were really at the bottom although i should mention that they had some sorts of protection because they did live on the estates of wealthy people all right and so in some ways these these wealthy elites they were part of the family of wealthy elites even if they're you know really at the bottom of the family uh, unlike landless peasants where you could just kind of get rid of them if you didn't want them okay the political system as i mentioned the greeks who settled in greece and eventually in asia minor and the islands settled into tribes i should mention a couple of them um over here is attica attica is going to be later where athens emerges i could mention this area here called laconia and laconia is going to be where sparta will eventually emerge slightly less famous but important later on is boetia and this is where the city of thebes is going to emerge and there were several others and so these tribes settled into this land and each tribe would have as i mentioned had an over king this is a king of kings and in, in a sense if you want to think of it that way and this king wasn't an absolute ruler he had other kings underneath him local kings if we want to think of it petty kings if you want to call them that and these people would have been underneath the over king they would have recognized him but he didn't have absolute authority of him over his under kings occasionally tribes would have had a tribal meeting of some sort here the over king would meet with some of the local kings um in the great hall of 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 the over king so it had a big hall and other high-ranking members would have come maybe talk about tribal policy maybe settle disputes and later on once they had made their decision they might inform other free men lesser ranking men who would have gathered and uh told them of the new policy and this is really if you even want to call this a government this was the government okay pretty weak pretty loose nobody uh you know it wasn't like the king passed law or something he had to talk to his uh local kings now each tribe would have probably had dozens maybe even 
scores of local villages. Most of these villages would have probably had a king of some sort, even if we put king in quotations. These probably weren't incredibly powerful people, but uh, we'll go with their terminology. Each king would have a house, a megara, it was called like a great house, where it would be a mini version of the great king's house. Here, the uh, local king would live with his family and local aristoi, the strong men who would live with him in his household. They were kind of his, uh, his muscle, so to speak. And they would dominate local affairs from here. And so um, they would be uh, the upstanding members of the village. Here they would meet with their local aristoi. Um, they would attract these people again by gifts of gold, cattle. They would be the ones here who would formulate policy and go out on raids to other territories and help settle local disputes when they arose. Um, but again, this was kind of a hands-off sort of government. It's not like, um, you know, they had tax collectors out there or anything like this. They're just the most prestigious member of the community that others would look to. Okay, so that really sums up our lecture on the Dark Ages. What I'd like you to do is to either go back or if you were going along and taking notes as I spoke, that's fine too. And what I'd like you to do is, is I would like you to describe the economic system of the Greek Dark Ages. What was it like? How did the economic system impact the social structure? How was the political structure set up? Did it have anything to do with the economics of the social structure? I'll see you next time.